Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And Alex, what would you say is your favorite Oscar Wilde play? Oh, jeez. Uh, you know, that one. Oh, that one. Oh, that was yep. a good one. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. That probably is one of his, his best works. Um, but we're actually going to be talking a little bit about... Um, uh, we're going to be talking about another great Oscar Wilde play that uh, you should you should definitely uh, definitely pick up. Uh, no, we're actually going to be talking about. Here we go. There. Here's my edit point. <laughs> we, today, Alex, we're actually going to be talking about Lady Windermere's fan, and uh, we couldn't think of a better person to discuss that with than Ed Turner who has written by the author of Lady Windermere's Fan. What a coincidence that is. Ed, thank you for com- being back on the show. Well, thank you for having me back. Yeah. Um, you have uh, a lot's been happening with by the author of Lady Windermere's Fan since last we left you. Yes, it was it was but a chrysalis last time, and now it is it is poised to kickstart. It is a finished document ready for the world. Oh, that's great. Um, and uh, just to, to recap, because you, you haven't technically been on the show for a year and a half now. Um, <laughs> so it's been a while. But uh, for anyone who might not remember, can you just give us a recap of what By the Author of Lady Windermere's Fan is? Um, I can do that. Sure. Uh, uh, By the Author of Lady Windermere's Fan is a, a story game, uh, kind of a... Highly narrative RPG, kind of in the style of, say, your fiasco or your kingdom. Uh, Except specifically, it is about a group of actors who, through an astounding level of mismanagement on the part of their producer and director, have reached opening night without knowing what play they're even supposed to be putting on. Uh, All they know for sure is that the sign out front says it is a little-known comedy by the master of the Victorian farce, Oscar Wilde, and with that to go on, they are just going to have to improvise. And a hilarity ensues. Almost inevitably. <laughs> Perfect. Because the best thing to give um, you know, a great satirist's play is improvisation. <laughs> I feel like that's what they were missing so much. Like, like if you were to freestyle Shakespeare, let's just try that. Yo, Juliet, it's, it's, how you doing? Yeah, it's a new sketch show. It's who's wild is it anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's an improv show. Just new style. That's why. Scenes from a very fancy hat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um. Now, so when you're writing that game, I'm realizing the interesting part about that is when you're writing that game, you're trying to write a game about people who are not familiar with the source material that is existing, but Mm -hmm. is not supposed to be existing to them. So how was that (laughs) to write to write that through? I I feel like the difference is that... um you may or may not want to actually know the style of Oscar Wilde, hmm. even if you don't know the play. I mean, I think you could you could get away without even knowing a tremendous amount of the style of Oscar Wilde. I have successfully played games with people who have who have never seen a Wilde play in their life. I know there are such people. Can you believe it? Hmm. Um... <laughs> Basically, the the kind of rules for setting up the story are uh, pretty. They're pretty light, but they are designed to make sure that you'll hit kind of the most important beats of a farce, which is that all the characters start off with some uh, some lie they have been telling to the world, some petty thing they are covering up. Uh, because that is just how people in Victorian England of uh, of wild in Wild's mind at least operate, 
And over the course of three acts, uh, everyone has their lie confronted several times, put into a position where the logical thing to do would be to uh, admit the truth, suck it up, and take their lumps. And, of course, they don't do that because the play doesn't continue on until you replace your lie with a bigger, grander, and even more indefensible one. Oh, so so basically, it didn't work. Let me think of something even uh, worse, and then maybe that will... <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> to ludicrous extents. Yeah, in in one of the games I've played uh, recently, a character started off uh, a, a lord who is telling people, even though he has never been any received any education whatsoever, he's telling people that he is perfectly literate, even though that is not true. And then by the end of Act Three, he is. Uh, by just natural series of uh, uh, defenses and escalations, telling people he is, in fact, the dean of Oxford College. <laughs> How did you not know this about me? <laughs> it's not like you have the internet back there. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you can't I look this feel, up. I feel like you could easily do this with today's political landscape and get away with it as well. Oh, g- goodness. <laughs> you <laughs> You could. Yes, you probably could. Uh, you know what? Just say fake news. You could just say that uh, the dean of college, uh, just fake news. They have somebody, they they look it up. It's not me. Fake news. It's They're just huge lies. They're huge. They're huge lies. Huge. Uh, yes, huge. Uh, I feel I feel uh, very much that uh, trying to improvise a play is sort of like our politics system. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of what you see. I Maybe they could learn something or two. I feel like Washington could take a really good hit uh, from uh, uh, by the author of Lady Windermere's fan. Maybe that's what, how you should market it, as a political uh, teaching tool. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be associated with that. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. So this well, is, is really a game meant for good actors, you know? <laughs> good, good. Okay, then maybe we do have to think of a different audience <laughs> for you. Um, I, I By nature, I mean, you were talking about, like, being a role-playing game, but I'm guessing that the actual, like, there, there really aren't much for, like, stats or anything for the characters, are there? No, there, there are no stats, no, no dice get rolled. Um... There, there aren't even a, a tremendous amount of rules to kind of guide what your character can do. Actually, most of the, well, much of the meat of the game is actually uh, ways to force you as players to kind of act theatrically. Mm. That is where almost all of the rules go in terms of what you can and cannot do in the game. So it's it's less of what you think of as a traditional RPG and more of a actual role playing game. Yeah, um, it it is also I have had pointed out to me the sort of thing that could be really kind of easily converted into a LARP, since the difference <laughs> between pretending to act out a play and acting out a play is mostly whether or not you have a chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's whether or not you're on stage. Yeah. Right. I feel like you need to send this to a few production companies. <laughs> uh, a couple different plays, some actor guilds, and be like, hey, so I've got this game. <laughs> and it's a game that teaches improv and theatrics or at least isn't that theme and you should <laughs> you could probably ask them if they wanted to like do a short game for you that would be pretty awesome the i would actual love that actors that would be great uh because i'm pretty sure that uh, a larp version of the game is literally just a play <laughs> it's just literally a play. <laughs> I, I actually, uh, one of my friends, I think, works for a theater company in over in New York, <laughs> and he's actually a big um, gamer, like D and D and stuff. So <laughs> I feel like I should be like, "Hey, would you like to do this?" Go for it. 
point yeah. it out. Be my guest. I, I might have to do that. And then we record it, and it becomes a YouTube sensation. Well, they, and, did, they just did um, Macbeth, but they did it like Macbeth in the Wasteland. Oh, like the Fallout 4 Wasteland? The kind of yeah, kind of Fallout? like the, the, that type of thing. Oh, wow. It was really, like I saw a ton of pictures. It was super interesting. Um, kind of off topic, sorry. That's okay. Uh, also, I think that that's the perfect setting for Macbeth, uh, because they don't have to worry about destroying their kingdom. It's already kind of destroyed anyway. There you go. Yeah. Lady Macbeth would have done very well in the Capital Wasteland. Just saying. <laughs> out, out damn spot. Yeah, it's, it's a death claw. Um, so, uh, Ed, if I, if I play by the author of Lady Windermere's fan, um... Are there certain characters laid out that I, I'm supposed to play, or do I kind of come up with a character by myself? Uh, you would be coming up with a character by yourself. Uh, kind of the only thing that is really strict is that all of the characters the people play are kind of self-important. Uh, not necessarily uh, the wealthy upper classes, even though that is most traditional, but people who think very highly of themselves, because... Those are the people who it is most funny to see fall <coughs> completely on their faces. Mm, absolutely. And, and it's worth noting, you also, you aren't restricted in this game to uh, Victorian-era London. Because I recognize that, as strange as it sounds, not everyone would actually be interested in a comedy of manners wearing a top hat and tails. So, the... <laughs> Yeah, Maybe. it's a specific audience. It's a very specific niche audience that you're getting into. Uh, so, so really, the the first thing you do in a game of by the author of uh, Lady Windermere's fan is you're going to be kind of creating the setting that you are going to work in, and and it might be post apocalyptic wasteland, or it might be, you know, fairy kingdom or spaceship or I don't know, whatever. A fairy spaceship sounds like a very special kind of spaceship. Actually, that raises a really good point. Because you aren't just creating the setting by itself. Uh, the first step in the game is actually to have every player secretly, without talking to one another or communicating their desires in any way, write down some sets that you could use. Just a, you know, a one-room set. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then, it really is like scenes from a hat. Yeah, basically. <laughs> you know, the, the Very kind of fancy. In-universe <sighs> explanation is, these are the sets that you happen to have on hand from previous shows you have done. <laughs> and then your first challenge is to look at all of these disparate things and come up with, you know, how am I going to make a play if one of my sets is a Japanese temple and another of my sets is the bridge of a ship and my third sh set is the moon right right um you landed on the moon with your ship mm -hmm. and uh it, 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 the, the japanese were already colonized there that sold sold I, great you know what I, I see that play yeah absolutely um, for folks that are probably not aware like i've i have not personally read uh lady windermere's fan um if I were to read the cliff notes of it, what would the play be about? Um, well, the the absolute cliff notes would be it is about a uh the main protagonist is a woman named Lady Windermere, perhaps obviously. <laughs> uh and she is happily married and living a reasonably good life and then suddenly things are thrown into disarray as a former suitor of her husband and a suitor of hers both sort of arrive into her life and uh, start kind of making mischief. And she tries to deal with that without revealing to anyone, you know, who these people are, what their past is all about. So, so aristocrats in a comedy of errors. Yeah, and which just... Also is the plot of, essentially, The Importance of Being Earnest or An Ideal Husband. Pretty much every Oscar Wilde play. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. It's, the, pretty much. 
pretty pretty much. The only thing that seems a little disparate for his work is uh like the Dorian Gray. Like that seems like the only thing that's not quite quite in that uh, ilk. But it's still like aristocrats dealing with a comedy of tragedy mm-hmm. in some ways. <laughs> like like a tragedy of errors. Um so it's self-important people who are telling lies and covering them up by any means necessary. And they all have a good laugh at the end. <laughs> well, that is what I remember most about the end of Dorian Gray. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And a good time was had by all. <laughs> and how every single Oscar Wilde play. But see, that was his book. The books mm-hmm. are different than the than the plays. That's the that's the real key there. Um, he uh, did, uh, you're you're probably more familiar with Wilde than I am. But did he write any like dramas for plays? Um, yes, he wrote, uh, a, an adaptation of the story of Salome, which, uh, was not a farce, is a, you know, a biblical story, hmm. and is, is definitely written for drama, but beyond that, you know, his, his, the bulk of his output, which really was only, uh, four, four plays of any note, was, uh, was farces about important people telling dumb lies yeah uh, aristocratic society gone wild pretty mm-hmm. much literally literally kish but um, <laughs> uh, so uh being that as that may be considering that wild did have a few other plays and they are uh, have some similar themes why was it uh lady windermere's fan that you wanted to base the game off of uh well that's actually kind of an interesting story um Good. So, <laughs> so thank you for asking it. I guess um, you're welcome. As as you may be aware, Oscar Wilde was uh, was either well. Sorry, I'm trying to get things straight in my head. Edit that that bit out. Sure. Edit all the things out. Edit everything I say out. Oh, we're not recording. Don't worry. <laughs> we should just, just improv the whole episode in the style of uh, just the dry run. Oscar Wilde. Yeah. We should. That would be good. <laughs> All right. I'm trying again. Okay. Sure. As you may be aware, Oscar Wilde um had a homosexual relationship uh mm-hmm. with a fellow named oh gosh, I believe it is Alfred Douglas, um, for which he was uh arrested because it was illegal in England at the time. It was considered an mm-hmm. act of gross indecency. Um and he served a couple years in prison, and then he sort of voluntarily exiled himself to France. Um, and during this time, he was uh, penniless and and basically dying. He died very shortly after he got out of prison. Um, this this is a sad story. Maybe I should have mentioned. Uh, but while this was going on, uh, he was trying to get his final play, his his final most well known and arguably best play, The Importance of Being Earnest. He was trying to get it published. It had been on stage uh, when he was arrested, when all the legal battle happened, and nobody would touch it because, you know, his his name was kind of anathema at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then eventually, after kind of a lot of desperation and and shopping around and calling in favors, he got a publishing company to agree that they would publish this play and they would you know send him money he he could live off of his writing uh but they wouldn't attach his name to it uh the the only credit he got was that uh this was by the author this was by the author of lady windermere's fan that is the only accreditation he got on his on his final plays uh and since which is again it's a sad story yeah uh, since this is a a game about kind of adding more works to Oscar Wilde's canon, uh, I thought it was the kind of irony that Wilde might have appreciated to mm-hmm. uh, sort of make that the title. It's it's dedicated to the plays he never got to write. Right, right. And uh, I I don't know a ton about Wilde, but I I always liked him as an author, and I get the feeling. Like just knowing the scant amount I do about his life, he probably found that kind of bemusing 
that that's what he got credit for. <laughs> that that's what they would give him. And I'm mm-hmm. sure he told it at parties from like there on out about that. It's great anecdotal material. So I don't know if it's sad. It's it, I think he would have found the humor in it. I I like to think so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do too. So uh, so Lady Windermere's fan was already published when all of this happened. Yeah. So that was he had. Let's see. I believe a woman of no importance and Lady Windermere's fan were already published. Um, and then his two later plays and and two better plays uh, were An Ideal Husband and The Importance of Being Earnest. And those are the ones that were only ever published as by the author of Lady Windermere's Fan. Obviously, since then, you can now go to a bookstore and find them with his actual Gospel name Fox. attached. <laughs> but... <laughs> how long did it do you know how long it took before that uh, that changed? You know, I do not. That would be an interesting thing to look up. If only I had a magic device that could look that up. No. <laughs> no, those don't exist. Those don't <laughs> exist. That's fine. Somebody, if anyone's interested, they'll look it up. I know they will. Uh, oh, okay. So, so that's interesting. Um, now, what you were talking about is that a year and a half when you were on, uh, it was it was but a glean in your eye. It was something that you were just working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Looking at it now that we we have the lens of time to to glance through, um, what are the biggest challenges that you had between that moment and uh, the finished product that you have today? Okay. Um, Well, I mean, I suppose probably the biggest challenge for me personally is kind of outside of the book itself, and that is just being able to make the time to actively work on a project that isn't for somebody else that doesn't necessarily have a paycheck attached to it, Mm -hmm. uh, which is always kind of difficult for me because I am a uh, a full-time homemaker. I've got a toddler uh, and that takes, he takes a lot of my energy. (laughs) (laughs) That thing. Yeah, that thing. Uh, he never appreciates my art, uh, <laughs> and and so you're you're sitting there like I have to write, you know, for work stuff, but then kid, so can't that sort and, of thing. And and also, you know, related to that, I have to play it sometimes. I have to at least make sure it functions. And right. Uh, that is another thing that takes a lot of time to to sort of set up and how how long did that take? Because I, I imagine play testing, considering it's all story based, is going to be the hardest thing. In the I process. feel like it wouldn't be the hardest thing. I feel like it would be the most time consuming thing, where you're actually you know putting on a play essentially uh, to do your game. Yeah, because... I mean it is definitely time consuming, especially since. Like if you're if you're playtesting you know, a more traditional RPG, you can just do a combat and make sure that works, and then right. go on with the just rest of your day. Test mechanics each by themselves, and then how they work together. Uh, mm-hmm. This one doesn't seem to be uh, very mechanically driven, though. It it's true. So you kind of have to cobble together a a full evening to to run it. From opening curtain to final bows, as it were. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, that was that was definitely. I don't know if I'd call it necessarily the hardest part, but it was pretty time consuming. Right. Well, we all know the waiting is the hardest part, not the playing. <laughs> uh, th- thank you, Tom so, Petty. So uh, on that Oscar note, Wilde of modern America. Yes. <laughs> being being that the game isn't mechanically driven. Um, What's the end objective like? Is there a win scenario or just kind of an enjoyment factor of it? I mean, I would I would argue that as in putting on an actual play, the win scenario is that you uh, you make it to the final curtain. <laughs> so not everyone dies by the end. Uh, I mean, your character can die, but as long as you as an actor survive, you still get to take a <laughs> bow. Oh, mm. well, that's fair enough. Uh, and and that makes it seem more Shakespearean. 
because uh, <laughs> most of those characters do die. So so maybe I don't know. Maybe it turns a comedy into a tragedy by the end. Uh, well, all the characters in in uh, Windermere get a happy ending. That is that's in the rules. It's codified. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I guess if your happy See, ending is you die, that's still allowed. I'm not gonna. Well, I wouldn't have to be in the play anymore. True. So you know, it's uh, you know, it's dark comedy, <laughs> but it's uh, workable. Did did Oscar Wilde really do dark comedy though? Um. Not necessarily. I mean, he, he he definitely did darker stuff, uh, but his plays were not necessarily, I wouldn't call them dark. Not a lot of death, not a lot of blood. But you know what? If you want to do a uh, a dark comedy and by the author Lady Windermere's fan, I am only too happy to see that happen. Make it happen, Alex. No, um, Nathan, you can have at that. No. I don't. I, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Your characters have all gotten cholera. Okay, that was a fun it's game. Like we're on the Oregon Trail now. Yeah, absolutely. You have died of dysentery. <laughs> that's that's in the play, and they've they've that's that's now canon. Oscar Wilde on the Oregon Trail. Nothing can go wrong or silly. Either these curtains go, or I do, or my oxen, or my entire party, <laughs> or or literally all of our hopes and dreams as we all die and perish on the Oregon Trail. I feel like I feel like that might have actually been a very interesting Oscar Wilde play if he had seen the Oregon Trail. That would have been a that would have been a good mashup. Uh, and you know what? By the author, of Lady Windermere's fan, you can make it happen. <laughs> See. That's it's magic. What we needed. It's magic. <laughs> Friendship is magic, and apparently Dorian Gray on the Oregon Trail would be magic too. Well, he oh, as long as he made sure that the picture didn't get shot by like one of those people that was trying to hunt for game, he could live forever on the Oregon Trail. He would not die of dysentery. <laughs> he would just have dysentery for the rest of time. He would just have oh, dysentery, and it would show terrible. on the it would show on the portrait. But he he wouldn't have to worry about. It. See, I think he's he is tailor made for this. That that feels like it's one of those uh like like modern mashup things like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. That that is is bound to happen, or like Abe Lincoln Vampire Hunter, something like that. Sense and sense something sense something with monsters. Dorian Gray. Yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly, Dorian Gray did make it into the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen movie. That that he did. So uh, I believe he died, though. I think so. Yeah, um, he was the lucky one. The rest <laughs> of us had to watch it. Um, <laughs> it was a it was a fine movie. Um, uh, yes, no, he did make it into the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I believe that uh, there was a, a vampire. That killed him, which kind of yeah, makes sense. I think so, or something like that. Something like that. I didn't really pay that much attention to it. <laughs> we watched it for Sean Connery, don't lie. Yeah, you you pretty much did. Yeah, <laughs> you, 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 you kind of have to. I feel like there's a lot of movies I've watched just because Sean Connery's in it and no other reason whatsoever. Like The Rock, I think I watched The Rock mostly because Sean Connery was in it. Not for Nick Cage's acting. Did not watch it for that. Uh, and and boy, now that I think about it, Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage in an Oscar Wilde play. <laughs> Come on. Can we just like send this game to, to Nick Cage and go to the, <laughs> the town? Just have fun. Just have yeah. fun and make sure the cameras are rolling. Just make fun. Make sure the cameras are rolling. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> It'll be <laughs> National Treasure 5 and Oscar Wilde. I have I have to steal the picture of Dorian Gray. <laughs> that's going to gonna be the next National Treasure movie. Man, I wish I knew like actors or something. It would be it would be great if if we knew uh, important people. We could, we could we could make this happen, Alex. I feel like that's a, the... uh, I did I did post on my friend that does uh that works at the theater company. I was like, "Hey, you still play games, right?" He's like, "I do. I don't have time." 
Uh, and I was like, I got this game that this guy made that we're talking to, and uh, gave him the link to your site. Cool. And, uh, yeah, I'm like, you should check it out. <laughs> um, That's... So, so, so maybe he'll be like, ooh, this sounds like fun. I would hope so. That would be, that would be great. That would be great. They have to record it, though, for posterity. Right, right. They you, gotta, you gotta turn the cameras off. And if Nick Cage just happens to show up, even better. And Keanu Reeves. <laughs> oh, God, and Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Don't disparage Keanu Reeves. Did you not see John Wick? Come on, son. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, dude, John Wick was really good. I like part two, too. But that's that's beside the point. We're talking about Oscar Wilde. We literally the Keanu Reeves of the Victorian era. <laughs> and uh, so so Ed, getting back to the actual game, which I guess we were talking about at some point, um, well, an hour ago or something. Yeah, an hour we're, ago. we're improvising the episode. Don't worry. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It's, it's a farce show. I'm making up even bigger and bigger lies as we go. Oh, oh, here you go. <laughs> Farscape. Oh, oh. That's, that's a good <laughs> setting for it too. There you go. I that mean that. Lady Windermere's fan on Moya. That would be uh, fascinating. Oscar. You know, fun, the funny part is, is John would be perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he kind of would. He kind of would. And and uh, Dargo is sort of a. Uh, it is sort of Victorian character in some ways. Yeah, there you, I mean that. There you <laughs> so, go. more the hacky slashy kind, but you know, it works. It happens. It would be it would be fun to see him put on a play. Yes. I think anyway, his name Rigel. Rigel oh, is a Rigel. self-important little man who lies Rigel. about anything. Rigel basically yes. is. Uh, an an Oscar Wilde character. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it's actually kind of ideal. <laughs> yeah, it, it sort it sort of is. If you think about the general characterization of all the the crew members on Moya, yeah, yeah, they they'd be perfect for this. It's sort of like space play. Sp- <laughs> importance of being John. Importance of being Moya. There you go. I got it. Anyway, what I was saying before we get on that tangent, uh, with with the game. Uh, does it rely more on uh, like the player interaction or d- the person running the game? Uh, it it is it is very much all about the player interaction. There's no strict GM figure. Um, everyone is kind of on equal, you know, equal standing to to make things happen. Um, there is going to be at any given point uh, one player is going to be the the spotlight which is to say they are the ones who they have to be on stage and the action is kind of focusing around what they're doing but like that is a role that gets passed around very quickly seamlessly in theory uh over the course of an act so it's it's basically all about having really it's all about having players yell at one another and yell over one another and okay. try to understand what is going on with the other characters. I, I feel like that's a normal game night anyway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's no different than playing Monopoly. <laughs> Same character interaction, basically. Except with, like, a bit of a higher discourse, because it's Oscar Wilde. But just a bit higher. Not much, because, I mean, even Monopoly is sort of about aristocrats trying to one-up each other. Mm-hmm. If you think about it. I built a hotel on Boardwalk. Yeah, that's great. I'm a slumlord. I built mine on Baltic and Mediterranean, damn it. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a comedy of errors. And you built six of them, that way nobody can afford the rent. Because the place is such a squalor, and that's why the drug problem exists. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> no, Baltic Avenue is a drug den. Uh, we don't, Hey, we, much like New Hampshire. Yeah, much like New Hampshire. I'm so glad we live here. Um, <laughs> so, um, now, the, boy, we get onto some good tangents, though. I will tell you, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm never always 
uh, I'm not always for tangents, but at least we get on some good ones. Um, so, Ed, the other question that I kind of had in the ideation phase of this was, uh, we we discussed like why you picked the particular uh, Oscar Wilde play, but why pick Oscar Wilde to begin with? Instead uh, of like Shakespeare, instead or of well, Plato so, yeah. or Homer, or... so some okay. that might be more you know generally recognizable to the to the masses. Not not the um, Monty Pythons, for instance. Hmm. Oh yes, absolutely, or all the Monty Pythons, but. <laughs> But yeah, why not like a Shakespeare, for instance? Um, well, I think I think one of the advantages of uh, kind of Oscar Wilde, or, or really more generally of of a farce as a a play structure, is that it lends itself pretty well to what the players are doing uh, in this. We're putting on a play that we have no idea what it's what it's about uh, uh, mode because both while the, the characters that they are portraying are kind of, they're spinning plates desperately so that nobody finds out the truth about, you know, whatever petty thing they are covering up. Nobody finds out that, Oh no, I wasn't born a Lord. Um, So they, they spin plates and they kind of frantically do anything in their power to just, prevent the utter collapse of of their life uh at least in their in their mind uh the players the actors are doing the same thing they are also <laughs> frantically spinning plates and and just sort of rolling with whatever happens in uh, a desperate attempt to prevent the audience from finding out they have no idea what's really going on uh to to just survive I, I mean, I think a couple times I've said now this is about surviving until the uh, to the final curtain, and that is kind of what I want it to feel like. This, you know, desperate fight for survival, even though the stakes are very low. Uh, obviously, it's still kind of a difficult, an enduring, an endurance challenge to to make it to the end. And I think these two ideas kind of nestle together really well. You are playing a desperate actor who's playing a desperate character. <laughs> that, yeah, there's a lot of desperation. I, I, uh, I would be desperate just in general getting up on stage. So uh, this makes sense to me. I, I kind of feel like you need to do a, a, an expansion or a variant with this, where the actors need to put the same play on like <laughs> multiple nights in a row. <laughs> oh, that would be so difficult. <laughs> Except where they don't know what they're doing, they kind of like you. You have to like shuffle it somehow for the next one. So like the first one, you do this way. All right, now you have to shift this and do it again, and try and you know, at, you know, improvise that you don't know what you're doing, but trying to replicate what you did the night before, and you just make it even more outlandish by doing so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think there should be an expansion where the entire play is done by French performance artists. <laughs> Mimes? No, 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 no. Like Cirque du Soleil style, like French performance actors. Like like acrobats and that sort of thing. And then they're trying to, you know, re- remember that, oh, okay, well, no, I'm not doing the acrobatic thing right now. I'm trying to recite lines in an English-speaking play, and, and I'm, I'm very, very French. And then they have to bring an elephant into it or something, and that's fun. Like that, I I think that that would be really stylish if nothing else. But then I feel like most of the characters would be basically just trying to figure out how to do a French accent convincingly. <laughs> well, I think the best French accents are the extremely unconvincing ones, anyway. Oh yes, just look at like South Park. I think like you, you, the second they go to Quebec in South Park, it's like there you go, good on you. Um, now you were mentioning too, like the the, the audience buying it. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you determine if the audience buys this outlandish play? Um, well, uh, you have you have little tokens for it actually. Uh, 
every every character or every player starts the game with uh, three little tokens, little you know, glass pebbles or coins or whatever that represent the audience's favor. How how much the audience is enjoying you as a performer in this play. Um, you have three to start because you know they bought a ticket, so they're extending you just a little bit of uh, goodwill. And whenever over the course of acting, when you are you know doing the role playing, if you break character for any reason. Uh, you lose one, it goes away, and the audience thinks less of you. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, since it is a a comedy, you can get them back uh, if you make if the other players find you funny. That because that's really the the best measurement for uh, for a comedy is well, how amusing are you? Whether the plot falls falls apart or holds together. So right. it's kind of kind of like. Uh, a fan mail system in that if one of the other characters says something that you think is just particularly amusing or actually makes you laugh out loud, you pass them some audience favor. You pass them a token to kind of silently say, good job. Good job, yeah. you. Okay. So, so Lady Windermere's fan mail, so to speak. <laughs> yes, exactly. Sort, sort of like that. Okay, great. Lady and, and, Windermere fanboyism. Great. There's a, a lightly competitive element as well, because whoever gets the most of them is the funniest and the oh. audience favorite. And at the end of all things, after you, you take your bows, whoever has the most audience favor gets to take the final bow and has the honor of naming the play that you all just performed. <laughs> oh, well, that's... That's awesome. And, and um, by honor, I mean challenge to come challenge. up with a pithy title, because that is really difficult. If you don't have a good title for it, can you just instantly lose all the favors that you got and you just you die should. on stage? <laughs> you should, yes. That really should be the key. Now, when uh, when the other players uh, give you a token, um, do they have to take one of their tokens away, or is there? Is no, there there's a like a, there's a pile in the center of the table. It's oh, okay. But now, in some ways, because like I'm imagining playing this mostly with Alex, uh, and I want him to lose all of his tokens so that uh, they flew him off the stage, and I feel like that's actually advantageous to me. <laughs> Why? Because then I can be like you know this guy, right? And uh, and and the audience will be like, yeah, screw him. We don't like him, but you're cool. So is there a certain advantage to keeping other people around in the play? Or do you kind of want to get rid of them so that you win by default? Um, I would say there is an advantage in keeping other people around since it's a lot easier to be funny when you have someone to bounce off of. Mm. And it's also, also not not this show. <laughs> it's a lot better when you're not running a show alone. It's true. <laughs> uh, and of course, you 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 are all ultimately in this together. Only one of you gets to give it the give it a title, but you all work together to reach the final curtain. I, I feel like if you did that at the end, you'd be like, "The title is Oscar Wilde's One Man Show." <laughs> yeah, exactly. But there were other people. They're all dead now. Nobody cares about that. The unbearable lightness of being alone. <laughs> um, Alex, if you got to the end of the play, what would you call it? Oh, man, it depends on the characters. The one thing in my head right now would be you'd call it a wild time and do it as a uh, time travel parody. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, <laughs> I think I would call it... Um, uh, I um, uh, uh, Oscar Mayer Wieners. <laughs> My, um, so uh, I'm glad that we got that out of the way. I feel like I don't want to know the plot of Oscar Mayer. I don't, I don't really either. I feel it's in the vein of Rocky Horror. There's a there, yeah yeah yeah. Oh, Rocky, and then uh, and then we're off to the races. If Oscar Wilde wrote. <laughs> Uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Maybe he did actually come to think of it. It feels like it's kind of in his roundhouse. I mean, nobody it, knows who really wrote it. No, no, and we don't have the internet, so let's face it, uh, we'll, we'll we'll never know. 
And it's fake news. We we have figured that out. Um, but it does seem like Oscar Wilde would have probably looked at Rocky Horror and go, I could have written that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that feels that feels like it's right up his alley. Um and and he would love to do the time warp. I would love to do the time warp. To to the point before I suggested any of that. Um, but uh so have have you uh Blah. Yeah, have you blah? I, I, blah. <laughs> my question, my actual question. Actually, Alex, did you have a question? I no, want go to- on. I want to I hear what you're trying to go with. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> what, is the, what is the strangest direction that this game has gone in in the playtests that you have done leading up to its release? Ooh, okay. That's a good question. Um, I'm gonna have to think about that for a sec, because it, invariably, yeah. it goes into a lot of strange directions pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think, what is the strangest direction it has gone in? My... <laughs> My instinct is to say that the the strangest game that I played, I guess it isn't too tremendously strange to to uh, kind of think about it after the fact, but certainly in the moment it was uh, uh, delightfully absurd, was a game in which all of the characters were either pirates, like as in of the Caribbean, uh, or otherwise uh, lived in the golden age of piracy. Uh, <laughs> and some of them were trying to prove themselves, and some of them were trying to, you know, get all of the booty, and some of them were uh, trying to just sort of live happy lives, safe from the ravages of piracy. But ultimately, by the last act, everyone's happy ending was to kind of abandon their dreams and get married and i don't Mm. mean that separate couples got married i mean that we just sort of decided nope we're one giant poly group that is the (laughs) happy ending we have gone with and it kind of came out of nowhere but it felt really good in the moment so so they all decided that we get all the booty from everyone yes the booty is at its finest when it's shared Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's all about the base. That's uh, the ta- that's the takeaway. Booty is at its finest when it's shared. Well, yeah, because because you don't want to hoard the booty for yourself. <laughs> you got you got to share it, share it with everybody, your entire crew. Um, and and uh, you know everybody enjoys that. Did everyone make it to the end? Yeah, everyone made it to the end. Usually everyone makes it to the end. It's, um, you know, it's a it's a happy ending. Everyone gets it, their it, happy ending. If uh if for instance your character dies, so let's let's say something happens, your character dies. Can you introduce a new character in the middle of the, the game? Um I would say like you do have uh, an intermission between the acts during which you can sort of revise what your character is and what their concept is. I think it's fair. You could turn yourself into, I don't know, their, uh, their twin or their <laughs> child or someone, or someone similar. Or you could also just be their ghost. I'm down with that. That, that would be fun. I could see that going terribly well in an Oscar Wilde-themed <laughs> game. Why uh, not? You I know, die. if Banquo can come back as a ghost for the second half of the play, then you you have the character die right before intermission, mm-hmm. and you bring them back after intermission as their ghost, and uh, you really screw up everything because suddenly now there's a ghost in the play. And see, now I really want to play this play, or at least watch this play, because that sounds fantastic. Or even better, you have your entire cast die and come back as ghosts. Or, better yet, <laughs> you have an entire cast that's basically just the Scooby Squad, 
And then one person is a ghost, and you have to figure out why old man Jenkins is trying to steal the money from the play. And that's your new play. <laughs> Not sure Scooby Doo call- would uh, make a great or a terrible. No, 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 Oscar no, it's, no. And right I'm going to call the play, and it's Scooby Doo. Where art thou? <laughs> That's what it's called, and that is canon. Just deal with it. Uh, <laughs> Hark! <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Hark, Shaggy. <Jiggy. laughs> Me and Scoop and the gang were trying to solve this play. Um, so. Uh, if you if you give him a Scooby snack, I think that he deserves the audience's favor. <laughs> there you go. You, you they're not favors; they're Scooby snacks. They're Scooby snacks. Yeah, we replace favors with Scooby snacks. Okay, good. We got. This to- is what happens when you come on our show. We just take your game and just turn it. Into we destroy it. We basically a bigger, a bigger- every <laughs> every single thing you're saying has turned into a stretch goal. Now, yeah, is- this, there you go <laughs> for the Kickstarter. It's it's a bigger attack. farce. <laughs> we we call it the scrappy pack <laughs> for, for the scooby-doo aficionado if we reach if we reach stretch goal three <laughs> this is what we're putting in if i uh, if we actually look at your kickstarter page and i see any of these stress goals i'm going to laugh <laughs> yeah that, that's going to be interesting you know while we're at it we should probably talk about the kickstarter um what is the... <laughs> nice segue nathan yeah we should probably actually do that a segue i'm a bear uh so the the stretch goals in that uh you know are forthcoming but um what is your goal for the kickstarter um my goal like my my what i hope to achieve is basically i just want to turn this uh this idea which exists digitally i mean the the book is all written up and laid out and edited and everything i just want to turn it into physical books and get those into the hands of interested people so as far as the kickstarter goes it's it's pretty modest um all all i'm really looking for is the the cash to make up for the stuff I've spent to get it this far and to be able to print it out and send it to people. That is not a bad goal. No, that's a very reasonable one. Um, how much are you trying to raise? Uh, it's going to be about $1,600. So that's, not not, that's, no. that's not bad at all. I yeah. feel like you definitely, I feel like you should be able to get that. I am hopeful. Um, We'll we will do our part. Thank uh, you. You know, with the show. Yes, that's that's what we can do. I'm um, definitely hoping this show will convince people to to actually play the game and not run flee screaming from the very idea. Well, not that- I, I, I hope it convinces them to play it as Scooby Doo in the game. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've kind of made that a thing. Um, and, uh, do you, do you have, cause I mean, that does seem like a pretty uh, low goal to achieve. Uh, do you have any stretch goals that you've already set? Um, at the moment, basically my only, uh, stretch goal is to add a few more, um, I call them, I call them playbills because that's thematic and they're just sort of pre-built groups of characters and sets and kind of the very, very broadest outline of how a plot can begin for people who don't want to do all of the frustrating setup bit and just sort of want to pick a... jump in. Yeah, pick a, uh, pick a, an idea and dive into it. Delve into it, if you were? No. <laughs> Sorry, we're not going to be able to at that. It was a good try. But, okay, so um, when does the Kickstarter actually start? That is a super good question, um, because it was supposed to start on the 16th of September, but that uh, has possibly changed, because that was a date I picked because it was right after... Uh, PAX, where I was going to be demoing the game, and now I'm not going to PAX because of uh, issues outside of my control. So it's uh, actually kind of a question right now. It's going to be forthcoming in the very yes. near future. I, I think right now my my plan is to um, 
start the Kickstarter on the in, in the middle of October because I'm going to Big Bad Con, and that was supposed to be like the last gasp to show off the game before the Kickstarter ended, and now it I think will turn into the first gasp to show off the game during the big opening days. But you know that that is actually a thing that is up in the air, and uh, I will keep you people informed. <laughs> Hooray, Fair enough. Um, and and I imagine that if they wanted to, they could also follow along with the information on your website. Absolutely. Um, and, and Twitter. And Twitter. Oh, Both my website and places. Twitter are Edly T, E-D-D-L-Y-T, with either a dot com after it or an at sign before it, depending on... You know, <laughs> depending what, on whatever what tickles you. Depending on the medium. Make sure you get the double Ds. Because uh, I, I make that uh, mistake. You don't have you don't have like a stutter. It's literally D D L Y T E D D L Y T M O U S C. Um, I don't. So, I don't know so why. really quick on the, on the note of the Kickstarter, how much would I have to um, pitch in to back to get a physical copy? Uh, if you wanted to get a physical copy shipped to your door, assuming that you live in the United States, that's going to be 25 American dollars. Uh, if you live outside of the United States, it's going to be more expensive because of shipping. Um, if you are a huge fan, uh, you could uh, bump up that bid to $35 just as a, a bonus, and you will get a... Uh, a copy that has been hand-signed, autographed by myself to you. Uh, and as a special bonus, uh, if you pledge $36, uh, you will get a copy that has been made out to you, and then I cross out your name and I write Ernest in its place. Because I think that's a hilarious joke worth $1 American. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Oh man, that, I like that. I want to be <laughs> earnest. I want to be earnest all day long. Um, now, uh, I, I have a question. Those are things I ask now. Questions. Those are things you would never stop asking. Would you? Would you like to ask a question? No, I was just making funny. <laughs> so, so wait. So the the thing is. Uh, you always ask questions. I never get to talk. Okay, Alex, why don't you talk? <laughs> um, I don't. Uh, I I got nothing. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, usually, usually I'll I'll ask stuff more about the mechanics and whatnot, obviously, um, because that's more where I'm typically interested in the game. Uh, <coughs> this this game in particular doesn't really have mechanics. This this, this is true. In fact. <laughs> Uh, and uh, would it be fair to say Ed, that that this really is a completely story driven game with with no real mechanics involved? Um, I would say that there are there are some mechanics. Um, they're not they're not tremendously robust. There's no dice rolling or or number crunching, uh, but there are mechanics that exist mostly to keep things feeling appropriately theatrical uh, in terms of. I mean, I already mentioned kind of audience favor as uh, it's a subtle, but it's a mechanic. And also positioning is important in that there is a difference between being on stage and off stage. And that kind of if you are on stage, your character is in one mode, you are in character and you must act. And if you are silent or if you screw up, then you lose tokens. And if you are off stage, there are things that you can accomplish to make the play work better. You can make sound effects. You can raise and lower the curtain. Uh, and most importantly, you can put on a costume uh, by which you can come back out on stage as an NPC, uh, if that is what is necessary <laughs> mm -hmm. to keep the plot moving forward. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So the the assassin NPC that comes in is really just somebody else improvising uh, a character that they didn't think was there before. Right. Well, actually, um, just to because I like limiting the options the actors have available to them. You have to plan out what NPCs you think might be useful before the play starts. So you, you have to be thematic to the sets that you decide you have. Um. 
I mean, you can have someone who is definitely out of place, but I think you'd have to be able to explain how and why they exist. So no, so no space cowboys roaming through Victorian era. Um, <laughs> you know what? If you want to do a space cowboy in Victorian era, go for it. I will allow it. <laughs> nice. Uh, but it also means the there's a very limited number of NPCs, uh, and just kind of the nature of the beast is they get shared amongst all of the characters. So if there's a space cowboy, probably every player will get a chance to play that particular NPC over the course of the show. Which is why it's really great to be the first person to to play them and give them just a loud and obnoxious accent that you can... <laughs> Uh, force the other players to try to copy if and when they come back on stage. But being that said, uh, where you're improvising and the players are improvising, what happens if they don't play the character the same because they're just improvising it? Um, well, then I would, I would say that the audience would probably be mad at them. Yeah, that's understandable. That's one of those things that you'd probably do if you did the... Uh, make them play it again a different night and try mm-hmm. to replicate it. <laughs> By the way, you gotta use the same NPC, but he's gotta be different. It's gotta be better. <laughs> yeah, just do what you did, but, like, way better. Just a hundred that, times better? Yeah, um, you know, and just, just to, to have fun with it. Just have fun with it. That's always good direction. <laughs> um... Real quick though, um, before uh, before we say anything else, um, I, I should mention that you've actually, and I guess I guess it's sort of your day job, is uh, you've actually made several um, adventure settings for uh, Fate Core. Yes, that's that is the writing I do that actually kind of is more regular because I have other people to work with, and there's more stability there than there is for a Kickstarter. Um, and yes, I have, I have made a a few settings since the last time I was here. Um, most recent, uh, kind of full fate world and they're all for the fate system. Uh, Mm -hmm. the world that came out was Mort's, uh, which is a, a world of adventure about a, well, about the world, our world, uh, some 50 years after the zombie apocalypse, uh, when being the people who kill zombies who are encroaching upon the city is a minimum wage job for losers <laughs> who can't get a better gig. <laughs> and that, that would be the morts? Those are the morts, yes. Yeah. I feel like we might have vaguely touched on that last time we talked. Maybe. I'm willing I don't think it had a name then, though. Or at least I don't remember the name. But I feel like we touched on that that specific bit. Well... It sounds familiar. Well, it is out. It is now playable and achievable. Um, And also, uh, the most recent thing that I... Uh, worked on isn't even officially out yet as we're talking but it is coming out this week which is the fate adversary toolkit which mm-hmm. i uh co-author i'm the co-author with brian engard uh which is just basically a a toolkit a guide for creating bad guys for your fate games oh yeah that that would be useful so he he did most of the kind of hard conceptual work, and then my job was to drum out a rogues gallery of uh, of bad guys across multiple different genres. Oh wow, that's uh, are, uh, that's cool. are any of the bad guys Oscar Wilde themed? You know what? Not <laughs> not specifically, but there is a a Regency romance playset uh, in which the bad guys are people who are competing for the affections of a couple that you are trying to get together. Which I think is, is pretty, pretty on brand for wild. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, now like, have you ever considered doing like an Oscar Wilde fate core setting? 
Uh, you know, I have not. I, that would be interesting. I could be into that. Yeah. So, so would it be an imp- improv fate core setting, or, or what? Uh, yeah, that or just characters that are like from an Oscar Wilde play in like an Oscar Wilde play that's real now. <laughs> A setting that's very much about being the uh, the upper class doing stupid things and trying yeah. to protect themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, aristocracy city. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much what it is, and and we'll uh, we'll just make it happen. No monsters, no fisticuffs, but a lot of rumor mongering. Oh, that's everybody a- plays a bard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. fate doesn't have classes, but everybody plays a bard. <laughs> everybody is in their heart a bard. Yes. Um, bards gone wild. That's what we could call it. Bard. Uh, uh, oh, there's got to be a bard vark. I just want <laughs> bard vark to be a thing. So it's like an aardvark playing the lute. Yes. It is. You you read my mind. <laughs> Why can that not be a thing? Because uh, I don't I don't do art. <laughs> you don't do art. Well, you should. And if anybody out there is listening to this, I need a picture of a bard vark. <laughs> just saying, I do. Maybe you know, it kind of like on its back, just kind of like rocking back and forth with a lute on his on, on his belly. <laughs> I think I'm that sure it's. Good. it's- I'm sure it's rocking out to a Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Volhemian Rhapsody. Oh, jeez. <laughs> now I need to know if Bard Vark is a thing. Excuse me. Is a <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. Yeah, yeah. No, I no, I, I think it, you can. Ooh. Oh, no, no, no. That's just a... a, Apparently there is a ship called Bardvark. (laughs) A ship. Yeah, somebody named, like, a motorboat a Bardvark. Don't ask me why they thought that was a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't even know why that would be a seafaring vessel. (laughs) But, oh my god, yeah, it's like a tugboat. And that's... (laughs) That's scary. I feel like that's going to be the episode title and image I use. Oh, wait. (laughs) There's a little picture. Sorry. There's a little picture. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Hoary Hedgehog. Bardvark. Yeah, there's a little picture of a Bardvark. Um, And, uh, you know, he looks like, you know, no one really understands his art. So that's fun. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Somebody somebody figure that out. Uh, earlier. They beat you to it. They yeah. ripped you off. Yeah, Alex, I'll have to I'll have to copy this and 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 put it in the thing for you. Just oh, to good. prove that uh that this is indeed a thing that is apparently on Deviant Art. And uh and, and aren't you happy that I <laughs> that I have done this? Here we go. Paste. There you go. Now you can oh, look at Bard Bark. Um well, bardvarks aside, I, uh... <laughs> that, that's an aardvark? That does not look like an aardvark. That no, looks like no. a pig. You know, pigs and aardvarks, in some ways, are very similar. <laughs> but pigs are not as good as, at being bards. What character class would a pig be? Pigly? A smuggler? Oh, a, a, a smuggler? A uh, barbarian. There you oh, go. Oh, barbarian. Oh. That's, there that's the best I could do on short notice. That 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 that's that's okay. That's okay. Um, you know, you know. I feel like a, a play setting you need to do for for uh, by the author of Lady Windermere's fan is a classic D and D setting where the players are players. Are, are, are the classes in a typical D and D style adventure, except they're actors in the play playing as characters doing a thing. 
I, that actually sounds like it could be really fun. I think it could be because you got the uh, it's the improv you get from Oscar Wilde, but then you're getting the traditional quote unquote class roles of D and D mixed in, where they're doing non traditional things. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll so take you, that. you get your char- you get your person like you're playing a D and D gaming character. You get people who are doing that, but it's no longer a D and D game with dice rolls or spells and magic. Well, there could be spells, magic, combat because you can do that. <laughs> sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But it would be you're doing an improv in the spirit of Oscar Wilde, and you don't really know what the theme is, and you don't know what the play is, so you have to improvise as these archetypes. Right. I, I see. Uh, personally, I was just thinking uh, Lady Windermere's fan in Zootopia. But, you know, yours is a good idea, too. And <laughs> yeah, you know, why not both at the same time, though? Oh, wow. Let's just Zootopia take it to the case. next level. Oh, that is how you get a bard vark. That's how you get your bard vark. <laughs> That's how we go back. It comes full circle. <laughs> you go to Zootopia, they want to play D&D, they end up playing by the author of Wind- Wind- Lady Windermere's Fan. Here we are. Perfect. It's, uh, it's Zooception. Zooception? Yeah. Like, like the, the god Zeus? Uh, oh, I don't want to get Greek because... myth in here, too. <laughs> because Zeus often turned into animals, didn't he? Oh... You're blowing my mind, man. That's how we got a bard vark. <laughs> it's just Zeus in disguise. It's Zeusception. Zeusception. That's uh, right. Yeah, we're pulling at strings here that don't blo- don't need to be pulled at. That's why the bard vark was not the popular uh, character class that it could be. It could never really hit the right chords. <sighs> <laughs> Oh man. Anyway, Ed, uh <laughs> This anyway. has been Yeah. Um <laughs> Boy, I wish I had anything more in the tank after Bard Vark. <laughs> <laughs> you know Sometimes, you know what you you won. Yeah. Bard Vark. Yeah. You know, and I I kind of feel like maybe I ran out of uh out of good ones in the tank way before that, but I kept going. <laughs> I I jumped the shark on that one. A shark. <laughs> we could have a shark as a character. Imagine if it was okay. It's Jaws, but Oscar Wilde made Jaws. <laughs> that would have been great. That would have been great. It'd been a comedy of errors. You know, Jaws and Roy Schneider are just like always at each other because uh, you know uh, uh, Captain Quint is, you know, off in a corner all the time and like does he does he like Roy Schneider more or does he like the, the does he like the shark? He's kinda hung up on the shark. This could be good. This this could be good. That's how we're gonna do the play. And you never really see the shark until about halfway through the movie or the play in this particular case. And then it's just a fin. Kind of comes out of the water. It's it's an NPC wearing a fin. It's an NPC wearing a fin. And and the great thing is the NPC gets all of the tokens by the end of the game. Because <laughs> really, people really just wanted the shark. The shark's and, the real star, no matter what you say. That's yeah, yeah. They named they named the movie after him, of course. They never named like the shark movies after something that is not the shark. Nobody's watching Steven Spielberg's Boat Guys. <laughs> uh, the next episode of Boat Guys. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that it would be as as great a movie to this day if it was just like Boat Guys, um, or or if it was like uh, people dealing with a tornado full of some kind of sea creatures. I don't think that that would have gone over very well either. There's there's so <laughs> powerful in the wind shark. I feel I feel like the whole script for Sharknado is actually just improv. Uh they were playing uh, uh Lady Windermere's fan and <laughs> it went horribly, horribly wrong. Sharknado it's plays a, that definitely stretch goal now. Yep. Yeah. Sharknado It's play- a it's a um what do you call it? It's a it's a 
tornado shark. It's a sharknado. Yeah. 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 You know that Ian Ziering was the one that won that and had to name the movie. <laughs> Like, yeah, that's, that's what happened at the end. No, maybe Tara Reed. Tara Reed would have named him Sharknado. Um, and, uh, and it just makes me really wish that the cast of Sharknado sat down and played this game. Well, you know what? I, I'm doing my part. You're doing your part. We're spreading the word. We're spreading the word. There's- should we just, uh, should we just like try to get Will Weed on the phone and see if we can get him to, uh, play? By the author of Lady Windermere's fan on tabletop. Oh, maybe he could get the rest of the Star Trek Next Generation crew together. Oh, we could do it on the on on the bridge of the Enterprise. And uh, I, I mean, come on, Patrick Stewart would be down. <laughs> Sir Patrick Stewart would be down for that. Whoopi Goldberg would be down for that. I just mean it would be funny to see it on tabletop because Will Wheaton's an actor. William Frakes would be down for that. <laughs> Brent Spiner <laughs> well Var Burton come on these that, these guys would love this Michael Dorn has nothing better to do <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Marina Sirtis looking for work and <laughs> some of them could re- <laughs> they, they could really use it they could really <laughs> they could really use the work Oh, and I want to give it to them. I don't. I don't have money to pay them, but you know, it, it, you never know. It, I think it's franchise worthy. <laughs> or not? <laughs> I think so. I'd I'd watch it. Yeah, I'd I, watch that. But I mean, you kind of have a vested interest in it. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> All right. Um. Yeah, I got nothing else. Uh, <laughs> Ed, is there is there anything else that we should probably know uh, ab- about uh, by the author of Lady Windermere's fan that we haven't covered? Oh, it's very good. Okay, that's great. Well, you know, just the idea of Zootopia, Jaws, and the Star Trek Enterprise makes me think that it was it was good by default. But you know, thank you for telling. Me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that definitely is something we uh, we had not considered the game being. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm glad I mentioned it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Scooby Doo's on the case. We got it all covered. <laughs> That's the. This is the strangest, uh, you know, play-based genre mashup that we have ever seen in this in this entire world. <laughs> just, uh, just random, random thematic things throughout history. <laughs> just throw stuff at the fan. Six. Well, you know, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. <laughs> like, you know, you can imagine that, you know, the Star Trek Enterprise uh, landed uh, on a beach somewhere and and Jaws was there. And uh, then one of the members of the Enterprise crew got eaten by Jaws and he became a gugga ghost. And then Scooby Doo's <laughs> crew had to come out. And and figure out what was going on with Jaws, and I'm of sorry, course, there's... we do have a spaceship in this narrative that you are. No, <laughs> you no, 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 no. They just drove out to the beach. The, the Star Trek Enterprise was like hovering over, sort of like when they had to to get that whale, like they yeah, they okay, come, okay. come down. And so then then the Scooby Doo crew have to go out there, but as soon as they do, there's a giant tornado, and Jaws gets lifted up into the air, uh, and where he gets transported to is Zootopia. And, that's and that all is where the say. story opens. And that's where the story <laughs> opens. And we're off to the races. That That's what the narrator reads as the setting. You know, it's the forward to the play. And the actors have no idea what's going to happen. That's the forward they get. And then it's like, go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I you're feel you're like, on. You're on. And now everybody has to, you know, pretend that it's it's perfectly normal that that fox is wearing a shirt but no pants. Just uh, now, Our Captain. Fox. There's there's always a fox. You were in Zootopia. The fox and the rabbit have to get along at some point. But then the shark comes down and eats the bull. So that happens. <laughs> because I feel like at this point it's it's pretty much just the Wizard of Oz. You know, you get sucked up in a tornado and get dropped down in a foreign world and. 
then there's a an evil sheep. It was a sheep in that, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. Yeah, pretty sure. Anywho. All right, then. Yeah, I'm out of, uh, I'm out of ideas. I think, <sighs> I think when we get down to uh, Jaws, NATO, uh, the next generation, where are you? I'm, I'm out. The Bardvark will take it from here. Um. Uh, oh, all right. Uh, I'm. I'm just gonna do an outro, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but I'm gonna give it a good old try. Um. Hmm. 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 Well then, I bet that's not what you signed up for, Ed. <laughs> oh no, this has been great. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is a kind of a good microcosm for how the game goes, though. You use up so many ideas, but then you have to just keep acting. Oh yeah, that is where the challenge comes in. We got all the tokens. We got all the tokens by the end of this. Yeah, but for like every second it takes you to think up an outro, that's that's oh, you got to spend a token. Audience is waiting. Yep, absolutely. Tink. Nathan's gonna be negative tokened. No, I can totally name this play. <laughs> it's called What? <laughs> should I just leave? Should I just leave the episode title like? Choose choose title here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's what you should do. Choose Good. choose your own title. Adventure title. <laughs> choose your own adventure title. That's what it should be. I might I might just do that. We're just gonna leave it off on yeah, at the end you have to name the play. So at the end of today's episode, you get to name the show. Let us know what you name it. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah, how I'll... we get user interaction. <laughs> yeah, we'll 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 do that at the end. That'll be fun. Uh, okay. Mm. Alex, did you ever consider playing a Bardvark? Uh, you know, I have once or twice, but I'd rather be a Barmadillo. Um, what's the difference? Armor. Oh, your armor class would be higher if you were a Barmadillo. Yeah. Good, good point. I have to give you that one. <laughs> that, that, that's good. Um, so, Alex, question for you. If uh, if there were folks out there who were interested in barmadillos or bardvarks, and they wanted to go and uh, maybe find out if we mentioned them on any other episodes of Dell, where could they go? Ah, uh, they shouldn't go anywhere. Um, you no. <laughs> you can find more episodes of Delve and possibly more mentions of Bardvark uh, over at delvecast dot com. D e l v e c a s t dot com. Spoiler alert, there aren't any. Um, and and uh, Ed, uh, to keep apprised of all things um, by the author of Lady Windermere's Fan, uh, where can folks go? Uh, best place to go would be my website at edlyt.com. That's E-D-D-L-Y-T dot com. Perfect. Um, and you can also find information about everything else you've done. True. Yes. Lots of good stuff. It's all oh, great. Yeah. It is all great. It's uh, it's all the stuff you did for, for Fate Core and uh, Synanthropes and To Stand Before the Dragon's Wrath, which we actually talked about the last time you were on. Also very cool ideas. Links uh, will be in the uh, show's descriptions to the former episodes. Yes. So that you can because, listen to, that, to it. Because we're nice like that once in a while. Yes, uh, we, we self-promote uh, egregiously and often. <laughs> um, you can uh, also find us on uh, a few different things. Actually, pretty much anywhere that you want to find podcasts. But uh, specifically, you can find us on iTunes and on Google Play. Uh, please rate and review and subscribe when you go. That's always helpful. Helps us get a little bit more noticed out there and in the digital with- and share with all your friends who enjoy games. Especially those who you uh, you improvise plays with. Uh, because I'm sure that they will enjoy it. I'm not sure, but the audience is favorable. <laughs> you can also find us on a thing called Twitter, and uh, I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited. Our show is at Delve Podcast. And Ed... You have a very easy to remember uh, Twitter handle. If I'm, I'm at Edley T. Also, E D D L Y T. 
Make sure you get that second D. That's the most important one. The second D means that you you passed. Because a lot of people don't know this in the grading system, but it whatever letter you get, if you fail and you have the F, if you get two Fs, it's like twice as good. Two two Fs actually are like a C. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Uh, you know, that's what my teacher said. That that's <laughs> that explains so much. Yeah, it, it certainly does. Um, I, I I don't know why they kicked me out of that school. Uh, anyway, um, boy, I feel like, I feel like this is the, the opportunity to try and name this episode at the end, uh, because I think we all won. I think we all got to the end of this play, a farce. The, the real winner is you, the listener. <laughs> that, that is true. And so, uh, I guess we, we name it, um, the real winner is the listener. That's the actual name. And it's not pandering at all. We actually don't have a name for this episode. <laughs> oh, I could probably think of one, but you know what? I I want anyone listening to leave a comment on the show or let us know via Twitter what you would name the episode. Because really, your ideas are probably better than ours. That's right. What we actually did here, and and people, you know, uh, eagle-eared listeners may realize this, is we essentially just played by the author of Lady Windermere's (laughs) Fan uh, if it was set on a podcast. So, really, if you think about it, you were the audience, and if you haven't booed us off by now, I think you deserve to have a chance to (laughs) have a go. This uh, this naming thing, um, but uh, we want to thank uh, Mr. Ed Turner for being on the show. Thank you, Ed. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh yeah, and uh, it didn't get weird at all. <laughs> so, not once. No, not once. It it was all very straight laced. Um, I uh, I have to go take my meds now. But uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and uh, and hopefully you are also one of Lady Windermere's fans. The more you know, little little rainbow comes up over the top. Uh, bye, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs> bye.